Hello and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja and in today's brief conversation I will be talking about Paulo Freire's concept of dialogic education. Now I do have of course a whole series on Paulo Freire and this was discussed sequentially in my discussion of chapter 3. But I've gotten quite a few queries about do I have a video on dialogic education or not so I thought I should record it separately. Part of it is also mentioned in my standalone um, conversation on the banking system of education. But in this video I will try to sum up what do we mean by dialogic education, right, and how does Freire theorize it and why does it matter for us to understand that. So please watch the video until the very end and then towards the end I will also let you know about what other videos to watch within the series to further augment your understanding of the concept and this practice of dialogic education. So here we go. So as I said earlier, I had covered this discussion in the beginning parts of my conversations on chapter 3. But before we go into discussing dialogic education, let us you know, revise our views of how does Freire define dialogue. Now we know on a surface level that a dialogue is an exchange between two equals, right? So what it presupposes is that it's an exchange where two people, they could have similar points of view, they could have different points of view, but they dialogue with each other. So a dialogue always presupposes an other as part of the communication. But the way he defines it first is on page 89 of the book and he goes and says, Dialogue is thus an existential necessity. And since dialogue is the encounter in, in which the united reflection and action of the dialoguers are addressed to the world, which is to be transformed and humanized, this dialogue cannot be reduced to the act of one person's depositing ideas in another. Or, nor can it become a simple exchange of ideas to be consumed by the discussants. Nor yet is it a hostile, polemical argument between those who are committed neither to the naming of the word nor to the search for truth, but rather to the imposition of their own truth. Because dialogue is an encounter, among women and men who name the world. And the, there's a good discussion of naming in my longer series. It must not be a situation where some name on behalf of others. It is an act of creation. It must not serve as a crafty instrument for the domination of one person by another. So dialogue in its very nature, it must have something substantive. But it must have that dialogical movement from one to the other. If I'm just imparting my knowledge into a passive recipient called the student, the situation is not dialogic, it's unequal. Or if I'm speaking for another, no matter how empathetic and sympathetic I might be, it's not dialogic because my voice is privileged, right? The question is for everyone to have their voices heard and for everyone to write history, right? Then he gives us certain attributes of a dialogue. What would it take for a dialogue to constitute itself, itself as a dialogue, as he means it? So a dialogue must be guided by love, right? Dialogue cannot exist in the absence of a profound love for the world and for the people who live in it. So it must be guided by that love for the world and for the people that encourages us to change it, right? 
then dialogue cannot exist without humility. So it cannot be a proud declaration of me knowing the world and changing it. One must enter this space with a certain degree of humility. The third attribute that he mentions is faith, right? Faith in people is an a priori requirement for dialogue. Not faith in God or universe and all, but faith that people are capable of changing the world, right? Or changing their own situation. So we have love, humility, faith, right? And then trust, right? Trust is contingent on the evidence which one party provides to the others of his true concrete intentions. So in a dialogic situation, then both parties must trust each other. And that trust is based in love, in humility, in faith. And finally, is hope that this entire exchange, right, must be hopeful, hopeful that change is possible, right? So these are some of the attributes, and then the praxis of it must be critical thinking. All of these attributes coming together in a dialogic situation must make possible a kind of thinking, which is thinking which does not separate itself from action, but constantly immerses itself in temporarily without fear of risks involved. So a thinking, critical thinking, that is related to praxis. Right? And praxis for Freire is always a combination of contemplation, thinking about the situation, and action. These two coming together form a praxis. Then he moves on to discussing his idea of what he considers authentic education, which you can also term dialogic education or problem-posing or problem-solving education, but its basic attributes is that it has to be dialogic. And what that means is, after all is said and done, is that the teacher and student relationship is that of co-learners. And the students are a speaking part of that experience. They are not just passive recipients, right? And when that is encouraged, when that happens in a classroom or in uh, outside the classroom, when there is that fair exchange where the teacher is transformed by the students and students are transformed by their exchange with the teacher, that is when education becomes authentic and hence dialogic. There is a two way movement. So overall then what we are learning is that dialogic education is offered in opposition to the banking model of education, right? And, and you already have watched my discussion, I hope, of the banking system of education. And that in its very essence, it has to be egalitarian. It has to be a kind of education where both the student and the teacher have a say in the matter, and where the students are not passive. Where education, the dialogic education, is also guided by a hope for change, love for humanity in the world, with a certain degree of humility to learn at both ends, where the both the parties trust each other and where they are developing a praxis, critical thinking, and a praxis for changing the world so that everyone can live in it with their fully realized humanity. So that's roughly my understanding of dialogic education. Now please bear in mind that you can use the term critical pedagogy, problem-posing education, problem-solving education, and still mean the same thing. Dialogic education is another way of saying the same thing. Okay. 
But the concept of being of the dialogue and being dialogic is crucial in Freire throughout from the beginning of the book till the end because in chapter four where he develops a revolutionary praxis through education, dialogue is the primary factor there. That kind of exchange as equals between the leaders and so-called led, right? So that's why understanding the concept of the dialogue and then dialogic education is important. Now, as I promised, that at the end I will also point you to other videos. So if you are on my channel and if you just search through my playlist on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and just go to Chapter 3, you can watch the summary of chapter three where I kind of summarize the ideas in chapter three, but the best way of understanding Freire's take on dialogue and dialogic education is if you watch chapter three lectures from the first conversation all the way till the end, and that would give you at least, you know, my reading of the text and my attempt at explaining it, and that would be a, a good investment of your time. So that's all. That was, you know, my opinions about the dialogic education. I hope it answered your questions, but if it doesn't, please do read the text more carefully, and it will give you more insights. I hope you are staying safe and taking care of each other. Please continue to do so, and I will be back with some other topic pretty soon. In the meantime, stay safe, take care of each other, and as always, from me to you, peace and love.